Hello. So welcome to the Building Blazor applications on a Mac. Um, definitely check out the weather app that Scott Hunter just mentioned. It's really cool, but we have some kind of simpler stuff to get started to talk more about what Blazor is and take you through an intro app. How to get your feet wet, and then yeah. we'll move to a more realistic app and make some changes there as well. Yeah. Oh, and I'm Kendra Havens. I'm a program manager on .NET and Visual Studio, and... I'm Dan Roth. I'm a program manager on the ASP.NET team. Cool. Okay, so Dan, what is Blazor? What is Blazor? There's so much talk about it I and know. so much excitement. So Blazor is a modern web framework for building client-side web apps using C# -sharp and .NET instead of JavaScript. Uh, it's cross-platform, it's open source, and it's based only on open web standards. Ooh. Now we've had ways to build web apps with .NET for a long time. A uh, traditional .NET web app, you take your .NET code and you put it on the server. And then the browser sends requests to your, your server, and it responds with dynamically generated HTML or JSON. That's a pretty typical .NET web application. But if you wanted to do anything that ran in the browser, well, that meant you had to use some JavaScript, yeah. like using one of whatever the popular JavaScript framework of the, the day mm -hmm. is. And that's cool. I mean, JavaScript's great. I mean, yeah, the, it's great. You kind of have to switch context, though, and that can kind of slow you down. So yeah, if it, I can stay in .NET code. That's kind of convenient if you can nice. use that same <laughs> tool belt and your, the, the same language, the same frameworks, the same tools, same build system across your entire application. That's what Blazor is all about. It's enabling you to build full stack web apps using .NET and C Sharp. That's what we've been oh, working on. Sweet. OK. So Blazor, you build client-side web apps using just .NET and C Sharp code. It also comes with a component model, so you can build reusable web UI components. You can package them up as NuGet packages and libraries mm -hmm. and share them with your friends. Um, it also enables you to use the same code on both sides of the wire. If you have some common logic, like validation logic or data models that you want to use both on the client and on the server, you can do that with Blazor. It's full stack web development with .NET. Uh, at the same time, if you have existing JavaScript code or oh, you want to... Oh, sorry. So we're sharing .NET code. So even like working in like F Sharp or Visual Basic, if I have libraries that I want to call from Blazor, yeah, I you can, can do, that. do that. It's just normal .NET assemblies that you're I calling like into it. your in, into in your Blazor application. Absolutely. Cool. And it, also, if you have JavaScript, uh, you can still use that as well. You can call into existing JavaScript libraries from your Blazor code, and even call back from the JavaScript code back into .NET through JavaScript interop. You can use that to also leverage all of the native functionality of the browser. Okay, so if I'm not like, or if I'm slowly migrating my app to Blazor or trying it out in some section, I can still use JavaScript at the same Don't time. Don't have to throw your JavaScript away. You cool. can just you reuse it in your existing Blazor application. How does that work? How is that possible? I That's know, it seems like magic. magic. <laughs> well, there's two ways that Blazor apps function. Um, the first mode we call Blazor Server. And the way Blazor Server works is that we set up a real-time connection with the browser. We use SignalR to do that. It's basically okay. a WebSocket connection. Brady has a talk on all on SignalR all later All about SignalR today. later okay. today. Definitely check, check out Blazor's talk. Then. Um, once we've got that real-time connection with the browser, we run your Blazor UI components on the server. Um, any UI events that happen in the browser, we send them over to the server, dispatch them to your components. The components run, they render, and then Blazor very cleverly figures out just the parts of your UI that have changed and serializes that diff back down to the browser to then be uh, rendered and updated. Uh, so it's a kind of a thin client model. You're, you're still running your UI components on the server, but you get that rich interactive feel that you would expect from like a JavaScript-based uh, single page application. OK. And in server, all of my C Sharp is compiling on the server yeah. still, not at all inside the browser. All, all the compil compilation happens at build time, but your mm -hmm. build code is going to be running on the server on .NET Core. It's not actually going to execute in the browser, right. but you still get the rich interactivity of being able to handle all the UI events and mm -hmm. update the DOM seamlessly without having to do a full browser refresh. But I have heard about things would you sharp to do that, yeah. Or not compiling, but executing. Executing, that's right. In so the browser. With Blazor WebAssembly. Blazor WebAssembly. What we do okay. is we, we can download with your app a full .NET runtime that's implemented in WebAssembly. Now, WebAssembly is an open web standard. It's basically a bytecode for the web. Uh, if you can compile your code to WebAssembly, that code can now run in any browser on any platform at near native speeds. Native as in like browser native. Well, pretty close to the wire. Like it's it's almost like an assembly language that's been standardized for the web. 
That so it's pretty fast. Super fast. And it's fast. <laughs> so we built a .NET runtime in WebAssembly that you can bring with your app. It's small and compact. And then you just download normal .NET assemblies Ooh. into the browser and execute them using that runtime. Okay. The same com UI components, the Blazor components, in this case, they're running in the browser itself. They do. They handle UI events. They calculate the diff about what needs to be updated. But that's mm -hmm. all happening in process in the browser client side. So I see our, our little slide here says preview. That's right. So Blazor WebAssembly is in preview. Blazor WebAssembly is in preview. Blazor Server, however, is ready to go for production. Go, go ahead and okay, click to yeah. the next when slide. When do I want to use which one here, Server versus WebAssembly? So Blazor Server shipped with .NET Core 3.0. OK, and LTS. It's also it. shipped with 3.1 LTS. LTS yeah. is a long-term support release. So Blazor Server is ready for production use today. You can put it in your websites, put it out in production. It's fully supported with a long-term support. Uh, life cycle. Uh, Blazor WebAssembly still in preview. Isn't quite done yet, but we're working real hard on it. We expect to have that finished up in just a few months later this, this year. How do you nice. pick between the two? Well, yeah. there's, there's some, some, some trade-offs with Blazor Server. The benefits there is, well, you're, you're, well, first of all, it's production it's ready. Current, yeah. So you can actually <laughs> use it right now. Uh, but it's, your code is also running on a full .NET Core runtime, so it's super fast on the server. And it treats the client as a basically a thin client. It has less demands on what the, the browser or the client device needs to do. So for example, if you want to support older browsers like IE 11, oh, you can sure. do that with a Blazor server application because there's no requirement to support WebAssembly. Blazor WebAssembly, on the other hand, uh, gives you that option of pushing and offloading uh, load from your server onto the client because it's a true client-side application. It can support things like offline scenarios. Um, that's still in preview, so it's not ready for use today, but it will open up some really cool scenarios in the future. Oh my gosh, I'm so pumped. Now, regardless of which model you pick, <laughs> though, like don't, don't get too hung up on picking one versus the other because the component model is the same. You write okay. your components once, and then you can use them in either hosting model. So you could start out, for example, with a Blazor server. server app. And if you want to switch to Blazor WebAssembly in the future, that's pretty trivial to Maybe do. Maybe when it goes to production, we can switch our components over. If that's what you okay. want to do. And use it everywhere. Oh my gosh, I'm so pumped. Shall we get started? Let's get started. OK. Let's do so some Blazor. I know you can get started by going to blazor.net. So we have a really simple URL to remember just blazor.net, and it'll take you to our main Blazor, um, I guess, landing page. And we can go to this Get Started documentation. And this will walk you through everything that you need to do to get started with Blazor, all the stuff you need to install. Uh, and if you're on a Mac, like I see that you are, there's a tab yeah. there for Visual Studio for Mac that has all the steps for getting Visual Studio for Mac set up with Blazor. So I've already installed .NET Core 3.1. And actually, since you're here, I won't read this. I'll just. I'll just launch Visual Studio, and you can walk me through Since it. Since you've already done it. You've already installed Visual Studio for yeah. Mac. You have .NET Core 3.1 on your machine, um, which comes with Visual Studio for Mac. So you're all ready, to actually, to go with Blazor development right now. All right. So since I got 3.1 installed, I already have a Blazor server template. And if I didn't see that there, I could actually just find that in just the regular app templates, Blazor yeah. server app. Under .NET Core. That's right. Cool. Oh, OK. And see, it's already targeting 3.1. Yep. We have a little authentication Tab. So in the latest preview of uh, Visual Studio for Mac, we they now have support for the authentication options for Blazor Server. So you can create Blazor Server apps that uh, support auth using ASP.NET Core identity. Cool. All right, I'll go ahead and initialize one. I called it Blazor App Seven. That's a wonderful. Seven's name for just a my favorite number. It has nothing to do with the precise number of times we <laughs> practice this. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. It's just lucky. It's a lucky number. <laughs> it yeah. is. So this will create you a new Blazor server application. It's all ready to go. A Blazor server app is just an ASP.NET Core application with a couple of additional things wired up to support Blazor server. Uh, why don't we go ahead and just run it so we can see what the application looks like? Yeah, sounds good. So the Visual Studio can now build your application, get it running. You can debug. You have full support for Blazor development within Visual Studio for Mac. Once this gets building and actually running, uh, we should see a sort of you know, standard single page app style style UI. I'll give it a second. It's coming. Slowly. I believe. <laughs> My visual there studio goes. might have there fallen is. asleep as we were we'll talking. Blame cool. that. We'll blame, blame that on the browser. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can tab <laughs> around. You have different tabs for different different pages. This is all being cool. handled through client side routing. On the home page, you have some simple static markup. Nothing too fancy going on there. On the counter page, though, you have a, a button that you can click. And as you click, the count goes up. 
There's no page refresh happening here. The DOM is just getting fluidly updated. Normally, that would require some JavaScript to do, but that's all happening um, using C Sharp and .NET. Neat. Now, to see how that's working. Yeah, and then this, this fetch data page is basically a dynamically generated uh, table of, of weather forecast data. Ooh. So let's take a look at that counter page. So that's implemented in this counter.razor file. And you can see it's pretty simple. It's mostly just H standard HTML markup. Uh, at the top, it says that, that this is a routable component. So at oh, page yeah. says that when we browse to slash counter, we should mm -hmm. end up here. So if you go to the browser, you should see in the URL okay. at the counter tab, yep, slash counter, got that's it. where we're at. And then you have some normal HTML markup. We've got uh, a button that we can click, and there's that onClick attribute. Normally, that standard HTML on click attribute would have some JavaScript in it. But here, we're using razor syntax, a little at sign to say, right. no, no, no. Say, I would hey, like to use some C Sharp. We've got C Sharp code here. Go and, down to that. And it's pointing to your C Sharp method Neat. increment count. That's incrementing the current count field, which then gets re-rendered on the page. Yeah. Now, to show that that really is running C Sharp code, when every, every time we click that button, <laughs> set that breakpoint. Let's see if we can hit got a breakpoint so in, our, in our code. So that was on counter page. Yeah. There we go. Ooh, got so there it. We're in our C Sharp method. Neat. Writing client side web UI using, using Blazor. So, so let's see. What else is going on here? Um, well, the nice thing about these components, like all these .razor files, they, they get turned into normal .NET classes as part of the build. And now you can reuse them. Like if you wanted to have another counter component someplace in your app, you can do that by just adding that component wherever you'd like it to be. So for example, if we wanted to add a counter component to the home page, like let's say we wanted two counters, one yeah. on the counter tab, one on the home page. If you go back to the, um, let's go to the index.razor file, that's the home page for the application. Got it. OK, so here it just has markup. There's nothing really interesting going on. But let's start typing bracket counter, angle bracket counter on here. So yeah, and you can see you get awesome IntelliSense and Visual Studio for Mac. And now it's showing up purple. That's that's signaling to you that this is a, a component. Yeah. You know, a, a Blazor component. If we rerun the application on Wait, the home page now. Is that purple or brown? Uh, I think it's I purple. might be a little bit colorblind. <laughs> Purpley, dot net purple. Every once Close in a while, <laughs> you learn new things about how you perceive the world. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe my. <laughs> OK, uh, so I added the counter component, and I'm going to go ahead and F5 again. Yeah. And so app. now when I go to the index, yeah, it has a completely new component, a part of it. So, so I didn't need to like copy in the counter code or anything. It's just inheriting that component. A reusable chunk of UI. You can nice. click on it. It works just like the other one did. And if you go to the other counter page, you see it has a, an independent count that's separate from, from the right. counter on the home page. You can also pass data into components. Like Components can have parameters. To define a parameter on, the, on a component, let's, let's go to counter and make it configurable, you know, parameterized how much it counts with each click. Yeah. So to do that, you just add a property. And the property can be made a component parameter by attributing it with the parameter attribute. Gotcha. I have a little tip I want to show in here. Visual Studio for Mac does indeed have snippets. So if I just type prop and tab tab, oh, it automatically loads in my property. Sweet. OK. Save some typing. What so were you let's, saying? So yeah, let's we'll make add... it an int. Yeah, and let's call it uh, increment amount, I think, would be good. And let's default the value of that property to just one. Yeah, oh, give, yeah give, it sure. the, give it the parameter attribute too. That's, that's cool. So that to that's what's really going to make this um, a, a parameter for the component that we can pass in. Cool. So by default, it'll be one. And now in the increment count method, instead of incrementing by one each time, doing a standard increment, we'll increment by increment amount. Yeah, so current count plus increment amount. Perfect. You get lovely IntelliSense for your C -sharp code like inside it. your Razor Scanning files. Over my local variables. Now go back to the index page and let's use that parameter. Let's pass in an argument. So if we go to index, now uh, just add some space after the R, and then you can see increment amount shows up. Wow. The way, the way you set parameters in Blazor is just using standard attribute syntax. And now the counter on the home page should increment by 10, whereas the one on the counter tab should just default to the standard uh, increment gotcha. amount of 1. I just kind of chose 10. I hope that's a good number. That is a great number. 10 times better than <laughs> it was before. Good. So should that's, that build? That should spin bar. up. And we should see, OK, let's check this. Yeah, so now it's incrementing by increments of 10, hey. whereas the counter on the, the counter tab should still be doing by 1 because we didn't pass, a, pass any parameter value. Yeah, so it's oh, still sure. doing by 1. Yeah. Now, how is this working? Like we said, this was yeah. all based on that magic real-time pipe. We yeah. can actually see that happening. If you um, 
Go ahead uh, and inspect. Yeah, inspect the in the browser dev tools. Let's look at the network. And if you do a do a full reload so we can see all the stuff that's being uh, downloaded. Sure. I think that's like holding the shift key or something. There we yeah. go. So you can see that this app's pretty thin. It's not downloading very much stuff. It's just a little over 400 kilobytes of, of download. Mm -hmm. And all the magic is really happening in that first request, that underscore blazer WebSocket request. Yeah. Ooh. And you see uh, when you look at the messages, you can see there's all these binary messages flying on that WebSocket connection. Yeah, it's updating as we speak. If you clear it, let's clear them all out. Yeah. And then go click on the button. On Oops. the uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Here, I'll button. clear again um, and use the keyboard shortcut. There's lots of buttons to click on. Try the uh, yeah, that'll work. Yeah, and then click clear it and click oh, on the click the me. Click me button. That's yeah, what you're yeah. saying. So and this that, is going so see, every time to the click, server. Every time you click, we send the UI event to the server. Your counter component gets the message. It re-renders itself, and then the DOM updates get sent back to the client. That's what's happening here. This is how that's how this app is working. This is a Blazor server-based app. Cool. So that's that's counter. Now I know if you go back to the code real quick on the yeah. counter.razor file, um, some people really like you notice that there was that at code block at the bottom. Yeah, right there. So at code, yeah. that's basically a chunk of code that's going to get added to the generated class uh, for this counter.razor file. It's like a bunch of class members, and some people really like that that code lives in the same file because all your UI code is in one place. Other people would prefer to have that in like a normal C-sharp file, like in a code behind file, yeah. which is totally cool. You can do that in Blazor as well. Um, what you can do is add a, uh, let's add a C-sharp file to the pages directory. Um, let's call it counter.razor.cs. That's sort of the, the standard naming convention for a code behind file. Look good? Yeah, okay. that looks good. What? It automatically put it underneath a... Uh... I put a whole my bunch of razor. licensing Sorry. information. I was out. messing with my <laughs> header demo um, uh -oh. <laughs> for later today for the productivity talk. I'll delete that. We won't you add don't get to see this yet. You have to wait till this afternoon, <laughs> and we'll talk about how to put headers oh. at the top of new classes. And we don't automatically license like all your C-sharp files that get added. No, no, no. no. <laughs> that would be bananas. Yeah. I specifically chose the MIT license. Cool. Well, we have a counter class now. <laughs> now, this right. matches the name of the class that will be generated from counter.razor. So let's make it a partial class. So can this? Oh, OK. Yeah, grab, you grab that code. Go ahead and grab that. That, that. That's fine. Go ahead and copy that out of there. And we're going to move Steel. it into here. We don't need the constructor, so we can just copy over the constructor. But make the class a partial class, so it will be combined class. with the generated class for the component. And then you probably need to resolve some namespaces. Right, and I can do that with Alt-Enter. Yeah. So that opens up the little light bulb that I get, so I can automatically add usings. Beautiful. Love so it. I guess all the normal C-sharp productivity enhancements and features now are available to you in this, yeah. this C-sharp Yeah, and I'm getting file. another little suggestion. So this actually might have annoyed some people when I did this originally. I didn't use a compound assignment. It was all part of my plan. And VS so, Remap just takes care of that. <laughs> yeah, so VS Remap gave me the suggestion that I can simplify that. That does look better. Yay. Yeah, cool. So this should be the same as what you had before. Like, there's no difference in the right. code. It's just that we've refactored should the Should I run the it code. to prove it? Yeah, go ahead and run it to make sure it's still working. <laughs> That's pretty nice. Like, the you know, C Sharp's uh, got a lot of nice uh, features oh and languages. Oh, my gosh. All of the little things. That's what I work on. That's my C Sharp little things. It is beautiful. Refactorings, code fixes, productivity. That looks like it was before. So okay. it should still have like, you know, increment click, by 10 click, and click. all that stuff. Yeah. Still increments by 10. Looks good. What other C sharp stuff can you can you do in, in VS for Mac? Does it support all the, the Visual Studio? Uh, it does. So right now we actually share the same editor. So basically everything that we've added actually latest in like Visual Studio and Windows 16.5 preview two, I believe is what we're on. All of those are actually already piped into Visual Studio for Mac. Nice. And I can demo those later today with Michaela. There's a, there's a whole talk on that stuff. Yeah, style. there's like a shared editor, so it's all piped in. Okay. Yeah. So like uh, uh, like adding an overload? Like is that is that? Oh, yeah. So if I do Alt-Enter, um, our keyboard shortcut to open the little tooltips, I can generate, generate oh, override. Overrides. I meant to say. Yeah, override, sorry. I always so get my C sharp terminology messed up. You can do up. something like, oh, this is cool. like the, the click thing about this you is you can see all of the component lifecycle events in yeah. this UI, like the on initialize, on parameter set. These are all standard events in the lifecycle of a component. Um, so, like, yeah, if you wanted to like run some code when this counter component is first and uh, after it's initialized, you would override uh, on initialize or on initialize async if you have some async logic. I think the mm. uh, fetch data component actually does that. So this is this is the component that was generating that dynamic table of weather forecast yeah. data, and if you look at the bottom, all the way at the bottom, there's a 
Yeah, there. So you see uninitialized async. There's Sorry, that I was example. Distracted by how cool it was to have a C sharp for each loop <laughs> no. printing out your Razor. table. It's that's, super cool. Okay. Sorry. Continue. Uh, that's, 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 that's good. <laughs> like, so yeah, there's uninitialized async. That's that's when this component gets initialized. You see, it's using that weather forecast service to mm -hmm. get all the weather forecast data. Uh, where's that forecast service coming from? If you scroll all the way back up to the top, yeah. there's this uh, at inject directive. What at inject is doing is it is a way to do dependency injection into your components. Wow. So you can get services that you've configured. Here we have a weather forecast service that we're injecting into this particular component. And then below is just normal razor syntax, like you were, you were saying. It's mostly standard HTML markup, but intermingled with <laughs> C sharp like logic. If statement, yeah. If statements uh, for each loops, like we are just looping over each weather forecast instance to generate the rows in that table. That's how that weather forecast wow. uh, table is being generated. Super cool. So we started sort of to get more into realistic scenarios. This was just the file new template. This is the basic is stuff. Is there like a level two app that we can use and show off? Sure. So I've been working on a uh, recipe app in, in Blazor um, to like you know manage a list of recipes and do recipe ratings and those types of things. Why don't you pull that I up? Think yeah, I that's, found that's, it. that's my repo. <laughs> you, if you guys want to, if you want to download and, and and see my code, like <laughs> Dan <laughs> Roth twenty seven. Okay, got it. Best for you recipes. Best for you recipes. All right, let's see if I can open this up. So now I usually I've been bigger. developing this on Windows actually on uh, Visual Studio. But it opens great on Visual Studio for Mac. Builds, runs, debugs, all those things just work as expected. Um, once this opens up, why don't we just go ahead and, and run it first just to see okay. what the app is capable of. I'm going to wait till I load my workspace documents. Perfect. And maybe restore my NuGet packages. That's probably important. I always kind of want to always do that. Always restore your NuGet packages check. before you build and run. It's you good hear tip. that, kids? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's lifestyle choice. OK, so I'll try to. It's saving. Da, da, da. Might have gotten a weird state. While, while we're uh, waiting, yeah. waiting for that, we can go ahead and look at the home page at least. Let's uh, let's open uh, index.razor so we can see a little bit what the when we see the app, we'll have an idea of what the code looks like. This is the home page for the application, and you can see there at the top, go. it's mostly just a, there's a search box, and then a little bit of uh, an if if else then to 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 see if the recipes have loaded. Oh, yeah. And once they've loaded, it's just generating an unordered list. Uh, with a list item for each recipe that it loads from uh, a recipe store. And again, we're using dependency injection to get a recipe store service and to initialize the, the, the list of recipes. Yeah. So that's all that's doing. That search box at the top is a custom component for handling the searches. Um, why don't you scroll back up to the top and we can look at that real quick. Yeah, so Sorry. you can see <laughs> that on the search box, uh, we're passing in normal HTML attributes to like specify a placeholder, but we're also able to oh, specify yeah. a delegate for when a search has occurred, so that we can hook into that and actually then uh, run the query against our store. So it looks like the app's now up and running. Yeah. So here's that home page that oh uh, gosh, actually rendered. Oh my gosh! Beautiful. Nice, nice images. You must have stars. got some help. You can <laughs> a little <laughs> Visually? bit. A little bit. Yeah. See, a design is not my forte. <laughs> Well, you can click on recipes. You can see details about the recipes. Yeah, I can some basic functionality. If you got search, a search bar. Search for chocolate stuff. Yeah. Now notice that as you type, the search is updating. Like you're not hitting enter as you're yeah. as you're typing. It's just looking at the current state of the search query and running a search. But it's not doing it on every single keystroke. It's like a little. There's a little pause that yeah. it waits to see if you're done typing, and then it does a search. And that's nice because it's throttling all the searches to your database. So you're not just hammering the database with every single keystroke. Um, so it's interesting to see how that's implemented in Blazor. If we look at the search box component, that's where all that logic is encapsulated. So searchbox.razor yeah, up there at is. the top. Now, th this is that component that just implements the search text box. And it's handling all that debouncing logic, where every time you search, it will wait a little bit until the, uh, after you're done typing. So mostly, you can see that this is just an input. Like, scroll, scroll, to see the markup at the top. It's an input. And that System dot timers. Yeah, okay. and it's bringing in the timers namespace. The uh, attributes at attributes attribute there. What that's doing is allowing you to grab any additional attributes that are passed on the component and sort of splatting them wherever you want them to be. <laughs> that's how that placeholder holder attribute is getting onto the input. And then that at bind is binding the value of the input to the search query text uh, search query uh, property. So as you type. Blazor will see that the, 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 the text has changed and then set that text onto the search query property, which I think you have uh, uh, below 
Yeah, right there. Yeah. there. And it's actually even specified as a parameter. So if you want to pass it in, you can do that. And we know that it's going to do that on every single keystroke because after at bind, back at the top, at the end of the, uh, the input, oh, all sure. the way at the end, yeah. see that at bind colon event? That's specifying which event we want to use for the bind. Like by default, it will do it on change. Here we're saying, no, 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 I want it on every single input. Every time you type, <laughs> please update the value of the search query uh, um, uh, property. And then now let's look at search query because there's some that's where the little bit of cleverness is happening. Search query, when it's set, like when the value gets bound, it just starts a normal .NET timer. And this is just, you know, it's like you saw up above, system timers or whatever, whatever the namespace is. It's a normal .NET timer from the, the base class library where it will stop the timer if it's already been started and start a new one. And if that timer completes, then you know there was a pause without any keystrokes hit. And that's when it'll actually call back into the, the search query changed oh, event callback it. that was passed in. So is that's that that debounce parameter there, that yep. 300 milliseconds? That's, okay. that's the, the amount of time we want to wait. And you can see in an on initialize, there's that uh, component lifecycle event again. That's where right. we're renewing up the timer, setting up the debounce time frame, and wiring up the event handler for when the timer actually completes. So all the event handler does is call into your delegate that you passed in, and then you get your, your search results. That's debouncing logic in you know, you know, 50, uh, 50 some odd lines of code, all done in C Sharp. No JavaScript wow. required. That's great. Um, so should we go back to slides? Are we short on time? I think. I we forgot wanna, what time we were supposed we to make, We want to make one change. Oh, we got five minutes. Let's, oh, good. We we let's make let's just make an edit to this app. Let's make a change to this app. <laughs> OK. So um, if you go back to the what app. What do we want to do? Yeah. Let's go back to the app and look at the, uh, yeah, re re reload. Oh, right. I stopped it, stop the So the, um, you could click on the recipe, and that brings you to a recipe details page. Okay. And most of that's just markup, and there's even a form where you can do star ratings. But there's also these tags, and currently, if you click on a tag, they are links, but they don't they don't go anywhere. Oh. Like they don't. They don't do <laughs> okay. So right. what we want to do, it is it is going to a new URL. It's going to slash tag and For, then the, yeah. the, the name of the tag that we uh, that you clicked on. Mm -hmm. Let's wire that up so that we actually end up on the search page, but with the correct list yeah. of, of recipes. Okay. So at, go back to index.razor. Okay. What we want to do is grab that value out of the URI. So in order to do that, we're going to add another route. So add another at page directive and make it slash tag and then slash. Now, so that's in curly braces because this is the value we want to grab out. And we'll call the value that we're going to grab out tag. OK, now okay. to get that value, we're going to bind it to as a parameter on this component. So add a new parameter. Remember we added a property before to create uh -huh. a parameter. Do in the code block, let's create a new property. So prop in tab tab block. in the oh, code right block. Oh, right, right, recipes. Yep. All right. Anywhere, it doesn't prop really matter tab, where. Prop tab tab, thank you. Let's make it up Love type it. String, string and call it tag. Tag. Oh. Oops. Tab again. There, there you go. go. OK, so and then put the para uh, parameter attribute on it. So now what the Blazor will do is it will take the value from the route and set it on that property. So now we can just pass it in to the the get recipes. Yeah. All and if right. it's null, like if it's not specified yet, then we probably just will pass empty. That will give us all the recipes when the, the, the tag is initialized. One more thing is up above in the um, in the search box. Let's make sure we s populate the search box with the tag if there's one there. So set the search query uh, uh, parameter. Oops. Did I? Get a little space in there. So there we go. Some... There, there you yeah, go. That's okay. the you get a lovely IntelliSense. And I wanted it to just to, fill all that in for at me. Do sign and tag. Oh, so we're actually getting into the C Sharp property there you go. with that at sign. Okay. And that's all you need cool. to do. So now it should populate the tag. So go ahead and run it. Okay. Re restart it. And that should populate the search box with the tag as you click on tags. Uh, that will uh, filter the search to just that tag whenever you click on a, a tag leak on the page. And it should be just that easy. OK, so click on a recipe. Let's go down to the tags. Let's, the tags. I don't know, fruit. There's only one fruit, but that, that works. And it populated the It populated. The search box. You just added a feature to my app. Thank Hooray. you so much. Hooray. You're welcome. All right, well, now <laughs> let's hop back to slides real quick. Sure. So that was getting started with Blazor and some Blazor in action. Um, we know the number one question on a lot of people mi people's minds, if we have time for Q&A and stuff, is, um, what is next for Blazor WebAssembly? When, when, when we get it, when will it be out of preview? Yeah, so, so this was all Blazor Server uh, work that we were doing with Visual Studio for Mac. Visual Studio for Mac fully supports Blazor Server, which is great. Uh, Blazor WebAssembly is still in preview. It hasn't shipped yet. Um, it is the, the, the focus of the Blazor team right now, and we are planning to release it in May of this year as a supported release. Ooh. And that will include full support in Visual Studio for Mac. 
Um, the initial release of Blazor WebAssembly will be based on .NET Core 3.1. In mm -hmm. fact, we plan to add the template in an update to the .NET Core 3.1 SDK. Um, it will be a current release, not an LTS release. So it's not going to inherit the LTS status of the rest of .NET Core 3.1. It is the mm -hmm. first release of Blazor WebAssembly. We want to give it a little bake time before we bless it as an LTS release. To try and make that clear, we're going to update the versions of the packages to be 3.2. We've actually already started doing that, so the latest previews are versioned as 3.2. Okay. After May, Blazor WebAssembly will become part of .NET 5 and will then be just part of the normal .NET uh, update release cycle. So I just need to remember to keep clicking yes on that update prompt. Keep, keep, keep updating and, and okay. look in May for the, uh, the, the release version of Blazor WebAssembly. Got it. Um, so, in summary, um, we talked a little bit about being productive in Blazor on VS for Mac. Uh, Blazor Server is what we showed today. It is in production. You can go and use it with .NET Core 3.1 and get excited for May 2020. For Blazor WebAssembly. For Blazor WebAssembly. Yeah. Uh, so, Q&A time? Questions? Are there questions? That's, that's exactly it. I'm going to actually start with a statement. Somebody said, I want Dan Roth's Visual Studio <laughs> t-shirt. <laughs> You can be an so, Uber geek too. I know, but you know what? We have uh, some exciting t-shirts for this event and we'll be giving them out as part of our party. So make sure you stick around for until the end of the day. Oh, so wow. not just that, but more. Uh, and we actually have some uh, questions as well. So the first one is, hey, VS for Mac, is there any way I can explore on Blazor WebAssembly in Visual Studio Mac? That we were just talking about that. <laughs> yeah. So you, you can actually open a Blazor WebAssembly app in VS for Mac today. Mm -hmm. um, you'll need to use the ASP.NET Core hosted version of the template. Um, the standalone version of the Blazor WebAssembly uh, template that isn't uh, working just yet in VS for Mac, but it will by the time we ship Blazor WebAssembly in the May timeframe. Uh, you don't have the ability to create Blazor WebAssembly apps from VS for Mac just yet, but that is coming as well. So you can create apps from the command line as long as they're hosted in an ASP.NET Core app and run and develop your components and all that. The rest of the functionality will be, com will be coming later as we cl get closer to the May release. That's great. Well, there you have it. And next one is, let me just close this one down. Is there a performance benefit using Blazor Server over a Blazor WebAssembly? Yeah, so Blazor Server runs on a full .NET Core runtime. Your components are running on the server, so you get all the performance benefits of .NET Core, which is honestly one of the fastest stacks on the planet. Um, it really treats the, the client machine also as a thin client, so it has very little uh, requirements on the client side of the, of the application. Blazor WebAssembly runs on an IL interpreter-based runtime today. So if you have components that are doing really computationally intensive stuff, it can drag a little bit when you're running that type of code in the browser. So you might want to offload that to like a web API somehow onto your server so you're running it on the full .NET Core runtime. Perfect. I think we have time for just one more question. So uh, uh, yeah, the question is, is there a benefit using Blazor over Angular or React or some other SPA? Well, yeah, I mean, like, because you get to use C sharp. Yeah, you get no, to use all no the context switching. <laughs> you get all that syntactic goodness. All yep. the productivity <laughs> features in Visual Studio. Yeah, it's a full stack solution for web app development with .NET and C sharp. Um, I think also there's a, just a lot of really nice simplicity that comes from the the Blazor programming model and tooling. Like, it's really easy to get started, file a new project, and you're up and running in less than five minutes. So that can be really nice. That said, if you, if you love Angular and React and Vue and you want to continue to use those for your front-end development, you can absolutely still do that and still use .NET Core for your back-end APIs, gRPC services, Signaler hubs, and so forth. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time. It was fantastic to hear about all the Blazor coolness out there, and I'm looking forward to the 2020 build announcements that we're probably going to have.